Okay, welcome. I think this is actually part four now of this uh, part D of this uh, little expose into the uh, NASA worm symbol. I uh, hope you haven't been too bored with what we've been going through so far. Uh, we're now going to be talking about topography, and I've just had a quick flick through. We've still got a lot to cover. This is going to be. I'm going to. I'm going to be going into a part five. I'm sure of it, um, because we'll be talking now a bit about typography. So, uh, typography, sans serif Helvetica. So, Helvetica is the is the most important family of type in the NASA Unified Visual Communication System. Helvetica light is used in combination with the logo for, uh, type to form the fundamental elements of it identification. In addition, this typeface can be used in numerous media and a variety of situations to create a clean and contemporary visual uh, progr program. The, uh, the uh, cursive sans serif letter forms uh, make an ex extremely legible, even at, at, very, at very small sizes. So cursive to me is, um, is italics, uh, so I'm not sure what they mean by that. Uh, headings uh, um, which accompany Helvetica light text settings are set in Helvetica medium. In certain situations, Helvetica bold may be, uh, may be an appropriate alternative. Uh, headlines are in upper and lower case, so it's specifying how you sort of then do that, which is sort of funny because nowadays people tend to not follow these sorts of con con uh, the ways of conforming to the upper and lower case, etc., etc. Now, I, I have some clients that are um, that are editors and um, in PR and things like that who have ex absolute uh, you know adhere to the the style guide of upper and lower case very very stringently it's and I quite like working that way actually with people because it does make you um, it makes you appreciate sort of what's what's going on with different sorts of things now in this area like you've really only got the Helvetica light Helvetica medium now there was other within a decade or so of this there was there was other versions that came through Helvetica was designed in the late 1950s and so it came because again of technology uh, it, it what happened was because we had the this was this came with the advent of uh, photo typesetting and so with photo typesetting we could then go with much more sort of simpler shapes and we and and printing on paper was actually also better and so we could actually they could hold their shapes and so we actually had sort of um, uh, what was it called there was a printing process, and I, uh, I can't think of what it's actually called. It's just the name escapes me. But before that, it was like letterpress. Uh, letterpress would actually have you you'd have to have the individual types, uh, letters, letters themselves sort of set. Whereas with the photo type setting that actually sort of came, and it was then sort of done on a drum. Like you'd be actually sort of do it photographically, even in the in the printing process, onto a drum for the actual printing itself. You then actually had better quality that would come through, and it allowed this sort of typesetting to be done where you actually had much much cleaner fonts. But the old purists back in the 1950s and 60s thought that this looked grotesque, and so this became the name of this sort of style of lettering, where you've got the sans serif sort of style that is very mechanical in this in the way it's sort of presented and very nondescript. It's good. It doesn't have a personality, but it's still extremely useful. It's probably still the most prevalent font that's around. And you get derivatives of it. For example, I guess the most popular one at the moment is Roboto, which would also be considered a neo-grotesque or new-grotesque font. There was actually a series of fonts that came out before this, back from the 1940s, I think. They were, the, they were actually the, the actual grotesque fonts. And then by the 1960s, you had the neo-grotesque, the new-grotesque fonts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the the so the new grotesque fonts that you actually sort of had Helvetica was was I guess the the the, the shining example that really as soon as it was des designed became just so so popular all the typesetting houses it was the, it was probably one of the first fonts you'd get they would get um, Helvetica. Uh, the, 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 the Helvetica Light, Helvetica Medium, Helvetica Bold, they would be the ones you could specify with italic versions of those as well. Plus, you could then get Times New Roman. Just trying to think of what else you used to be able to sort of specify when you'd go off and get these things that were typeset. There wasn't much. You didn't have a real big range of different things you could actually choose. And so you'd have to mix between going with like a very limited range of, of fonts that could be typeset with um, using like uh, letter set lettering where you'd actually have to have rub down lettering to then do anything that was going to have to be a little bit unusual. And so you'd have to sort of buy in that that um, that uh, that's sort of lettering that you'd rub down. I think you can still get that actually. I, I, my wife had something that was very similar I saw there a, a couple of years back. <laughs> anyway, um, so Helvetica has got like a very interesting history because it really became... I guess the go-to font, and it still is the go-to font for anything that's technical. It doesn't have a personality, and when you have a look at this, and I say that not in a negative way, this is very, very legible. It's extremely legible to actually read it. It's very clean the way it sort of does come up, and but it doesn't actually sort of it doesn't present itself in a way that is trying to sort of communicate any sort of mood, which makes it very appropriate for 
any mood. So you can sort of use this as a, as a very legible way of actually presenting information. And so this, so the um, the the San Serif Helvetica, as I say, came out just a decade and a bit before, maybe twenty years before before this manual was sort of written. But by already by that stage, this was a very very popular font, and it sort of became popular right away. It's also called Swiss style fonts because it was the the, the person who who actually invented it was Swiss, and so it's often gr called grotesque or Swiss. But these are your go-to fonts, and what we tend to find nowadays in, in sort of like in these, uh, you know, around the, the, the 2020 mark, is we're finding that we're getting slightly humanistic versions of the actual fonts themselves, but still in this neo-grotesque sort of format. The old grotesque fonts were not as fine; they weren't as um, as well built. Uh, like this, uh, if you, have, you can look any up fonts up, like uh, an example of that would be looking at the difference between um, uh, future, not Futura. What am I trying to think? Franklin Gothic was a grotesque font, whereas Helvetica is a neo grotesque. And the difference is, if you look at the G, if, if like typically a, a, a original. Uh, old font would actually conform to the old serif style they were the first of these sort of sans serifs really and so the g would be like the the bowl like instead of having a bowl and a loop like in this it would actually be two bowls so it would actually have like a funny g like instead of actually having this sort of shape that would be one giveaway for it but it's just a much cleaner way of actually sort of presenting the actual font itself it was a simpler way and it was extremely legible it also wasn't as thick they, like the, you know, the letter forms were more refined because the printing processes had developed already you know so much in the, in the previous um, you know couple of decades since the actual grotesque fonts were designed so anyway that's the uh, that's the helvetica fonts back in through here uh, the two sort of styles, of course, is still sort of applicable even today. Um, you can see 10-point Helvetica light, 14-point um, Helvetica medium is what is being presented down through this side. And it's just giving an example of the actual lettering style itself. And so it is sort of saying that this is the preferred way of actually presenting the information. It's still a go-to way of doing things. It's actually still prevalent today because it, it's classic. It doesn't actually have a personality. As I say, fonts like Roboto now would be, which is what Google uses, is probably a better version. They, they tend to reproduce better now than, than these fonts, uh, particularly with the online, because these weren't designed for online printing at all. At all. So you, know, you get fonts that sort of do work a little bit better now on, on digital screens. But um, yeah, it's still, still a go-to font. Uh, particularly the Helvetica New, which was what we saw, I think, in the previous episode when I had a quick look at what um, NASA is currently using on their website. Helvetica New is a slightly refined version of Helvetica. It's got a little bit more air through the actual uh, through the, the kerning of the actual letters themselves. Um, anyway, let's continue on. Go to the next page. So this is Helvetica Light. It then says Typography Sans Serif Futura. So Futura is recommended for a number of reasons. <laughs> this would be funny, actually. The typeface is quite... I'm saying funny because of the era it's from. Um, the typeface is quite legible and is versatile enough for catalogue listings as well as for brochure applications. The precision letter forms have a technological character and make it a natural for certain NASA projects. Uh, okay, so, and the so future uh, face is designed with a small X height and will require special attention uh, when, um, when specifying the size in comparison to type faces enclosed in this section. You will note that 11 point Futura is comparable to appearance to 10 point Helvetica. So they've used 11 point Futura here, they've used 10 point here. So you can see that this one actually, the Helvetica looks bigger than the 11 point Futura. But um, yeah, so it's actually not quite sort of the way that you want that to sort of work. Now, this is quite funny because by the time I was trained a decade later, uh, Futura is recommended for a number of reasons. The typeface is quite legible. We were then told, the, avoid Futura. Futura. These, were, these are geometric fonts. And they're based on circles. See how it's got like a, a circular shape. Now, geometrics can either be square-based or circular-based. And so all of the all of the roundish sort of forms are, are like based on a circle. And so the geometric fonts... It's, it's more about the graphics than about the communication. And so when you sort of skim past them, you actually, as you skim past the lowercase letters, if you just sort of run your eye through, you'll find that you stutter everywhere there's a big circle. You're actually getting, you're getting caught through here, through here, through here. Like these are the areas when you skim through, they don't, you don't get the same feel when you skim through here. You don't get caught up. The actual, the, the, the actual color of the type, the type color is very, very consistent. 
all the way through when you actually sort of look at this, when you look at the actual colouring through here, it becomes difficult to read. And they found that within a decade of, of this thing being written that putting body text in this sort of font was actually not a good idea if people had to read a lot of it. It was okay to use it in small amounts. It was okay to use it in, in, um, in headings, but avoid it in body text because the, the, uh, the actual roundish forms became like they became difficult for people because it meant that their eyes kept on stumbling across the the big white spaces inside the lettering it's just funny funny that by that stage it was it was already sort of like scientifically not something that you would then do but in this era it was and this is because this is the era of the geometrics like the 1970s people loved their bubble writing their their um their geometric shapes They've just come out of the 1960s where, you know, geometric shapes were sort of really, really prevalent. Beautiful design work, I've got to say, back and through here, but not for body text. <laughs> yet, yet here they are recommending it. So it's quite funny to sort of see this. Um, uh, what else have they got there? The precision letter forms have a technological character, which is the geometric. So this is by the by the uh, by the 1980s and 90s, this, these were classified as geometric sort of uh, style of font. Um uh, technological character and make it a natural for certain NASA projects. Uh, the geometric side certainly would sort of work in with the actual NASA font itself, but quite often uh, it's not a good idea to mix the um, the, the, the neo-grotesque or, or the grotesques with the geometric unless you are just using it for uh, for this sort of treatment with um, with headings where you've got the, the headings in the, in the geometric because it, you know you're not going to stumble across a heading. But you can see even through here the, uh, the the small x height through this actually makes it less legible than than Helvetica. So if you're looking for legibility, I just prefer the look. And in fact, nowadays. Most places wouldn't actually use the medium. They would still actually go back to um, to just using the light everywhere or probably even just go back to Helvetica New and use something even lighter again for the heading. So you can sort of... You, the, the, these sort of rules are really well and truly out of the picture nowadays, you know, from what they actually were back and through here. But this one here, the, the, the low X height is actually a, a more of a problem than a help. So you can see this, this is the same size font, Helvetica Medium, as future demi future demi bold, but it's just not really something that's it, it just doesn't for me it doesn't work as a as a device. Uh, it it looks like it it clashes for me. I, I would not ever put those two together, not in this sort of instance, unless you're doing something trying to do something very very graphic. There's no way I'd put this into a style manual and allow people to use it. <laughs> It would be, uh, you know, please, uh, please refer to the the graphic standard uh, department, you know, just to see what other fonts you're allowed to use. This would not be listed there for that for the, exactly that reason. It's interesting though that they did actually specify that you do need to go up a point size to actually make it at least comparable. And even then, it's still not comparable when you flick back between the two. It's still not quite working the way that you'd want it to work uh, because of that very, very small X height. X height being the 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 height of the lowercase X in comparison to the actual. Uh, size of the of the of the capital. Okay, next font we're going to be looking at is Garamond. Now, uh, sorry, I should point out this font was developed in the 1920s, and so this comes from the Roaring Twenties era. And so you saw a lot of a lot of architecture use these sorts of fonts. That you see it on a lot of buildings uh, where there was a whole lot of fonts that came with with this geometric sort of style. And so the geometrics did come from the 1920s, 1930s. That's the era that they're from. Um, like you often sort of see the Art Deco would actually make use of these sorts of uh, fonts as well because they were artistic. They were just they look good uh, in that sort of in that sort of treatment. But I would not. And I guess people did use them a lot for technical stuff because of the geometric sort of shape. Interestingly. Not quite soon after this era, we then started to go into more square shaped fonts. Like there's a font called Eurostyle, for example. Yeah, where the, where, the, where the square shapes end up sort of becoming what you would sort of now start to see more of if you were using a geometric. But again, not good for body text. But you see it because the skill levels have dropped because of the digital design. <laughs> you now start to see so many of these sorts of mistakes being made again. But back in the, like, I think maybe the 1990s was a bit of a high point for typography because the, the people who were sort of specifying it back in that era um, really had to understand the best way of actually getting the typography to work. They couldn't just go to a computer and say, let's try this, let's try that. They had to really know. And uh, because it was all specified before it would go to the photographic typesetters, whereas uh, as soon as digital came in, it was give that a go, give this a go. And, and so most design ended up being done on the computer instead of being done on paper and, and sort of planning it out. So for me, it's quite interesting to sort of see the how 
how quickly the skill levels dropped in what was specified um, to make things harder to read and uh, like the the, the back end of the 1990s was, God, there was some horrific design that came out in that era as people came in without actually having the, the knowledge of the, uh, like, you know, of actually having to specify this stuff, uh, you know, back from the from the old days, which is which is quite interesting. But then nowadays, we're starting to see that skill level is now picking back up again. In recent years, I've sort of noticed there's a lot of really nice design coming back out again, where they're sort of adhering to the old principles of design that um, that people used to learn just by having to sort of manually and physically sort of work with the with the fonts rather than just pump, you know, pumping them out of a computer. Anyway, that's all just a bit of a, I guess, a side rant. Uh, we'll go to the next font, which is Garamond. Now, Garamond, the actual Garamond, I'll just read what it says and we'll talk about Garamond as well. So Garamond is perhaps the finest of the classical typefaces. It is a classic typeface. Uh, it has stood the test of time and pr proved itself to be as useful in contemporary design as it has been in more traditional applications. The main virtues of Garamond include superior readabilities, handsome uh, character, a distinctive italic, and certain special refinements such as old-style numerals. Garamond is, uh, is ideal for high-quality publications uh, or those of more permanent nature. It functions very well in large volume settings and will sustain a reader's retention. All very, very true, as true then as it is now. Uh, this is your. This is probably a, a, a nicer way to go rather than just your Times New Roman, which is sort of became the uh, with the with the advent of computers. You'd had your, you'd have your Arial, you'd have your Times New Roman, and that was basically it. Uh, you'd have a Verdana as well, which is your humanistic sort of uh, type font. Um, forget what else you, you actually came with, but anyway, um, Garamond was uh, is, is is has been a classic font for. Uh, centuries like it's actually it, it historically the the the, the garamond style of, of fonts uh, actually came from the 1400s or 1500s like back from when t when printing first started and so these were sort of loosely designed on the actual on the on the old monk's handwriting sort of style but it was done in, in a way that was really quite legible it's got some really nice little loops to things like the d's and stuff like this it's not it's not as con contrived again i don't know if this would be a great fit for NASA. I'm sort of again surprised that they chose this one, but this at this era, this was just considered a, a beautiful font, and it still is a great, great font. Um, I'm just trying to think if I've got any clients that actually use this as their corporate font. I don't think I've got any clients that use this at the moment, but certainly back through the uh, through the 1980s, 1990s, early 2000s, this was an absolute go-to classic font that um, always presented well. It always presented as classy, but it still actually had a little bit of softness about it as well. So it's just a, a really, really nice font to actually make use of. Everything they say here is, is dead, dead spot on. The actual Garamond that we end up using, I think, was also developed in the 1920s because it was actually more of a style than an actual font up until that point in time until they started to then sort of need to, need to have the actual typesetting itself. So so different um, different typesetting houses would produce different styles of Garamond and you can still actually find very wildly different sort of styles of Garamond until pretty much, I don't know when Adobe set theirs up, but it was, um, that would have become the stock standard Garamond. This looks like the Adobe version, but there's, you can find so many different versions of Garamond out there uh, from before the digital age. Uh, so even, you know, back, going way, way back, there was all sorts of, like, I think from memory, there was a Stemple Garamond, there was um, all sorts of, I think, uh, um, Italian Garamond, there's all sorts of different styles of Garamond all based because it had, it's got centuries of history. And um, again, it was designed with very minimal contrast between the thins and the thicks. And so it reproduces very, very well because this, again, was done in, in an era where it was actually um, uh, metal typesetting was actually where these where these letter forms actually came from originally. They tried to make it look like the monk handwriting from the, from the era before that. Uh, and it just did a really, really good job. There was actually a group of fonts that came out before this one that had an even smaller X height than the Garamonds. Uh, but this one is sort of like the next phase along, and it's still classic. It's still a, uh, a really, really good font choice. So anyway, um, so headings uh, maybe sit in Helvetica Medium or Garamond Bold. So it is saying you can you can use the Garamond Bold in through here. This became a really popular mix, actually, of, of using things like the Helvetica Medium and the Garamond Bold probably a decade after this was actually written. I don't know if there was much that was actually done this way in the 1970s. I wasn't really exposed to much there, but this was certainly a, a, um, a pretty classic sort of combination that you sort of see back through the 1980s, 1990s. Uh, so again, it's interesting to sort of see it through here, but Garamond was always one of the, um, 
one of the sort of standard ways of um, of presenting information. It was it, like you'd have your Times New Roman was sort of like a bit of a go-to with most things. But if you needed something, just that little bit of class above Times New Roman, you'd, you'd specify Garamond because that was one of the few fonts that you actually had available. Anyway, we'll continue on. Uh, then we've got the old <laughs> Times New Roman. I don't even know why they bothered putting this one in, to be honest, because... Like you'd almost think if you're going to, like it would almost say, okay, forget forget your Futura. You've got uh, your choices are Helvetica, uh, medium and uh, and light, and you use that for 99% of everything you're going to be doing, and then you go across to uh, your um, Garamond if you've got something that sort of requires something to be a little bit more classy than than what you've got there. I don't know why they would have put Times New Roman in. There was a some some research that was done, I think, in the late 70s, maybe early 80s where they, they, they tried to figure out what the most legible typeface actually was, and uh, Times New Roman won the won it over Helvetica. And, um, but the percentage points were just minimal. I think it was something like Times New Roman was legible at uh, something like 90, 98 or 99%, and uh, Helvetica was, was legible at, at like 1% lower or something like that. But they were the two top, top, <laughs> top fonts, and then you had other fonts like Garamond was sort of then less leg legible even than those. But it's sort of funny because designers back from the era of the, like the 19, certainly in the 1980s and 1990s would actually gravitate towards Times New Roman because of that research that was done. And yet it was only a very minimal percentage chance. I still remember that quite vividly, having arguments with other designers that you don't have to use Times New Roman to be legible. You can still use Helvetica uh, to actually still achieve the same thing. This, this is quite funny. Anyway, Times New Ro Times Roman, actually since it's not even Times New Roman, this is just Times Roman. Um, yeah, I think, when did, the Helvetica, when did the Times New Roman come in? This, uh, they're very similar. There's, there's slight differences between the two fonts. Uh, again, the history of these is from the 1930s, I think, is when both Times and Times New Roman came out. Times New Romans tended to be the one that was then used on computers. Um, so Times Roman is, is generally regarded as the best of the modern or transitional typefaces. Transitional is a is a term that, that refers between old style and sort of the more modern typefaces. So transitional is actually a, a very legible style of, uh, of font. The, um, Hel the Garamond would be considered an old style font. Uh, in fact, it says it there, such as old style numerals. It's, uh, but this is actually is an old style font, whereas Times New Roman is a transitional font, which made it quite legible. You still had the you still had nice thicks in the thin areas of the font. The, the version, the, the era after these sorts of fonts were, were developed, and even though this one was developed in the 1930s, I think it was, the transitional fonts actually were designed pretty much like the, the century before, a lot of them. Uh, and what they had was they had a nice big X height, uh, so they're quite legible. They had they weren't super thin through these, but then printing pr printing presses became a, a, an extra step of quality as you sort of got into the like the early 1910s, 1920s, and suddenly they found that they could actually go for thinner thins, and so they then went with uh, with a, like a, I think it's called a modern style now font, and that was actually different again. So you ended up with, uh, but these were always more legible. So again, the the very thin thins became something that was hard to read, so they became less legible. But this these were probably the most legible of the actual serif fonts, and so in fact, well, Times was the most legible. You know, it was recognised as the most legible font. So generally re uh, re regarded as the best of the modern or transitional typefaces. It's not a modern face. The classification of modern means thin thins, really thin thins. And usually see how there's like a bit of an angle, a slight angle that inclines backwards as if you'd written it with a pen. And that's actually the, the hallmark of both this and the old style. You'll tend to not have, you tend to have a slight angle of incline to these sorts of strokes. Uh, the modern f fonts were directly up and down, where you'd actually, it's, it's a bit hard to sort of see it there. It, just, it still has that same, well, transitional could even be the same way as well. This one does look like it's sort of straight up and down as well, actually. But that's actually a, a, a modern font. Yeah, so maybe modern, they could, they could argue that if the, if the, if the uh, stroke is, is sort of, it's the stroke weight is sort of straight up and down. Uh, but usually modern means very, very thin thins. And so um, it's a different sort of font. Um, it offers readability, char uh, character, and a certain utilitarian quality that makes it quite useful in publication design. This was designed for newspaper, basically the, tri the times in, in England. Yeah, so anyway, sorry, my dog keeps on barking. I've got to stop recording whenever it starts. Um, 
Yep, so Times is recommended for newsletters, house organs and other news-oriented publications. So once again, sort of like going back to something that doesn't really have a personality, like whereas the uh, Garamond certainly has a personality, this one doesn't have the personality. And so this one is, um, is, is going to sort of work more like um, Helvetica would then sort of be working with it without the, the personality. So that's the sort of difference in through there. This type of typeface is appropriate for large volume settings uh, as a reader does not uh, tire of, of the appearance. So again, it's sort of, it's recognizing uh, that sort of, that research that was then done into the legibility of this particular typeface. As I say, it became a problem because it became, it, in the 1980s and things, it became sort of like, well, if you're not using um, uh, Times New Roman or Times Roman, you basically are, um, you know, you, you, you're not, people won't be able to read what you're, what you're writing, which of course was completely wrong. Uh, so yeah, it's good that we no longer sort of uh, sort of set in stone the way it was for a, a little time back in, the, in that era. Uh, the entire family of Times Roman, including italic and bold, gives the designer a practical typeface to solve certain complicated problems. As I say, this was designed for the Times newspaper in, uh, in England and uh, was, was purpose built for legibility. So and it certainly does that, but it also doesn't really have for a serif. It doesn't really have a lot of a lot of personality. And quite often with a serif face, you sort of want a bit of personality. So for me, it's you know, I don't I don't think I don't know, I don't know when the last time I specified it. So headings may be set in Helvetica medium or Times Roman bold. Uh, so there we go. So you can sort of do it either way uh, with the way they've sort of got it. It's interesting that they've actually used they don't have any spacing above, which is something that. Um, by the t by the time the 1980s were coming it was it was very imp getting the the relationship between uh like blocks of text was actually very very important you would never do setting this hard but, uh, like by the 1980s so it's just interesting to sort of see it set this way uh back in the 1970s uh indenting the first uh like the first paragraph was also something that was very prevalent from, from this era as well. And actually all the way through the 1980s and even the 1990s, that was actually a fairly common sort of uh, treatment. All right, well, we are again nearly another half hour in and we now have a few examples. So what I think I might do is I might now make the last version of this coming up where we can then sort of talk about the different um, the different graphic treatments because this will be fairly interesting as well. Again, it'll, it'll be dictated a lot by what they could have done back in this in this era. Plus, we don't have the, the ability to sort of, they wouldn't have been able to reproduce things in full colour for this sort of uh, this sort of documentation. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave it there. So I'll catch you in the next episode.